Hello again, everybody. My name is John D. Healy. My podcast is called It's Good to Talk. People know me because I produce this book, and that's how it all started by Stoney McGurn. I'm sponsored by Liffey Van Lines, a moving company here in New York City. And they've been around longer than Jeopardy, over 50 years when it comes to lifting, that Liffey do the lifting. Now, today, I don't have a guest, but I do have a special treat for you guys because you've been so good to me, you've been following me. You've been subscribing, it's free to subscribe. Today I'm going to give you, yes, an audio version of this on the podcast, all for you, all for free. It'll be narrated by Danny Sweetman, and he will go through the whole story and explain himself and the book. Stoney was born in 1941. The stories are true and read up until recently. Stoney wrote the book with a pencil, something like this one. You see the rubber on the top? Stoney choose to write it with a pencil because he's not too good at spelling. So if he made a mistake, he could erase it. Now, we are a funny combination, Stoney and myself. We've been compared to Steve Hawkins, that be Stoney, and Helen Keller. Well, I'm the more intelligent one, I'm going to say. Helen died in 1968, and she produced a lot of books. Now, I really had a fun time producing the book. We got it out just at the time of the bloody coronavirus, which took the zap out of everybody, friends included, and you, I'm sure, as well. So it was a difficult time for us to try and do launches and all that. I'm glad now and happy now for you to listen to. So go ahead and enjoy. I won't tell you any more. But I'll tell you one thing. If you give me good feedback and a like and a subscribe, Stoney also has a DVD. I'll send you a free copy. My email, jhfernews at yahoo.com. jhfernews at yahoo.com. Please enjoy. It was on April 2nd, 1941, that I was born on a farm three miles from a small town called Dowra in County Leitrim, Ireland. It is the first town on the River Shannon, the longest river in Ireland. The River Shannon is 224 miles long and has three large lakes on it, Loch Allen, Loch Ree, and Loch Derg, all about four miles wide. It flows into the Atlantic Ocean from the estuary at Limerick City. Tourists come from all over the world for the fishing and leisure cruising. The Shannon River starts five miles from Dowra in County Cavan at a place called the Shannon Pot. It's a hole eight foot round that's so deep that when the local government dropped a chain two miles long down the hole, it still did not reach the bottom. The water bubbles up at such a speed that it becomes a river 400 foot wide when it reaches Dowra. There's a big bridge that leaves half the town in County Leitrim and half the town in County Cavan. Like all the places in the world, people who live in one area always seem to think that people from other areas are a little different than they are and they make jokes about them. Cavan people are supposed to be very thrifty and cheap. Here's one joke making fun of them. The Pope needed a special blood type and said he would pay 50,000 euros for it. A Cavan man who was the correct type had a doctor draw the blood and it was sent to the Pope. A year later, the Pope needed more blood and the Cavan man was very eager to send it again. This time, the Pope mailed him 200 euros. So the Cavan man asked, Why 50,000 euros the first time but only 200 euros the second time? The Pope answered him, But I've got Cavan blood in me now. My first memory of life was when I was three and a half years old. It was morning, and my mother was baking a cake, and my older sisters, Vera and Bernadette, were going out the door to school. By the way, I had eight sisters and one brother. I asked my mother when I can go to school, and she said everybody starts school at four years old. I remember my first day at school. My older sisters, Bernadette and Vera, took me to Mrs. Clancy. Mrs. Clancy took me by the hand and sat me in the front row and started to teach. A few minutes went by, and she started beating a girl. The girl was crying, and she still kept beating her, and I don't know what for. I thought then, I don't think I like school. Two days later, Father Lynch comes to the school. He lines up the six, seven, and eight-year-olds along the wall and starts asking them questions. One boy and one girl each didn't know the answer. He slaps her around the head, her hair flying from side to side. Now I'm scared. Now I really don't like school. We walked three miles to school. Some kids walked six miles, all at four years old. 
School in Ireland was much worse in my parents' day. I recall going up into the mountains at Tullahan, where my mother's farm was. We rode the horse and cart. Sometimes we would sit and let our feet hang down. Sometimes we would stand. We would pass by four or five farmhouses on the way. One house was owned by Yankee Fallon, an odd man. Odd because he was very hard of hearing. He would sit at the window and look out at the countryside. He had a big apple tree that grew out over the road, with apples hanging out of it. One day, my father Pat and I were standing on the cart. The horse was walking slowly, and as we went under the apples, I reached up and pulled one. My father said, You shouldn't have done that. Why? I asked. Because if he's looking out the window, he will be out to talk to us on the way back. I asked my father, how long was Yankee Fallon in America? He said he never was in America. Why then is he called Yankee Fallon? My father says he's a little older than him, but they all went to the rock school. The school was above on a rock. Back then, the schoolmasters were really brutal. The master's name was Flynn. If you came home and told your parents that the teacher beat you, they would say you must have deserved it, and then maybe hit you again. My father said that when Fallon was 12 years old, he was a tough kid. He would stand up to anybody. One Thursday, going home from school, he got into a fight and he outboxed the other kid. He figured if he didn't go to school on Friday, by Monday it would all have been forgotten. Monday came and he went to school late. Master Flynn had his back to the door, writing on the blackboard. He heard the door. Creak, creak, creak. He turned around, and it was Fallon. Well, 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 you were not here on Friday, and you're late today. Where were you? I was in America, said Fallon. Oh, says Flynn, we've got ourselves a Yankee. And he proceeded to beat Fallon until blood came out of his ear. He's been deaf in that ear ever since. I heard a man once say that kids on a farm were born to work, and their fathers started them very early. When the father came in at night, he put his shoes at the end of the stairs that went up to the loft, or, if the family was well off, went up to the bedroom on the second floor. In the morning, he would sit by the fire and put his socks on, and when the kid was able to crawl, the father would say, Go get the shoes! Go, go, go! He would point, Go! Go get the shoes! And the kid would crawl down, and then look back and the father would say, Yeah, yeah, bring it! The kid would put one little hand in a shoe and, with a big smile, crawl back. The father would rub his head and say, Good boy! Good boy! Now, go! Go get the other one! This was his introduction to work. Killing Rats We would pick the new potatoes in September, bring a couple of cartloads home for food for the winter, and then put the rest of the potatoes in a pile called a heap. We covered them with 10 to 12 inches of clay so that the frost wouldn't get at them. In the spring, we would bring them in from the field. I recall one time James E. Dano, who was a full-time worker for my father, was on his knees sorting the good potatoes from the bad ones. We all knew they were rats inside from the holes they had made. Well, this one big rat jumped out by James's knee. James grabbed the rat with both hands and wrung its neck and threw it to the side. We kids all screamed and ran away. Now that I'm remembering stories about rats... All farmhouses kept cats and terrier dogs to control the rats and mice. One day we were bringing the oats in when we got to the bottom of the stack and saw there were holes in the ground. This guy, Tim Dolan, put his hand all the way down into the burrow. He pulled a big rat out, holding it tightly around its neck. He walked around tapping the rat on its head and with a finger on the other hand saying, You're going to die! You're going to die! And he killed it. Shop and Gossip Our house and shop were 200 yards from the post office. People would come every Friday to get their old age pension one pound notes. If they could not come themselves, their neighbor, son, daughter, wife, whoever was going that way could pick it up for them. They would then come to our shop and pick up a few things they might need. The bus stopped at the shop three days a week at 10 a.m. There was a road between the shop and the post office that ended in a T-junction at the main road. One mile up, there lived a man named James Cornyn. James had a brother named Tom, who was a traffic cop in Dublin from the time he was 19 until he was 65. 
he retired and came home to live with his brother. After a few years at home, he went senile. Back then, when a man in Ireland became a cop, he had to buy his own uniform, and he was allowed to take it home when he retired. When Tom went senile, he would put on his uniform and go down to the T-junction and direct traffic. But there was no traffic, only the mail van at 8 a.m. and the bus at 10 a.m. Both drivers knew Tom, and he would put his hand up, and they would stop and wait and wait until he finally waved them on. We kids loved it. The people who owned the post office were Lizzie and John. As a kid, I was there every chance I got. Lizzie baked her soda bread and walked across the street and put it on a hedge, which grew over into the field to let it cool for an hour. When I was four years old, I would go into the field and go under the hedge and pull the raisins out and eat them. Being a kid, I thought nobody would know until, one day, I ran into Lizzie's kitchen like I did every chance I got, and she was making a cake. She told me a story. She said that when she put her loaf of bread out on the hedge that a little bird would come and eat the raisins from the bottom. She looked at me and said, You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a small loaf. Then the little bird will eat the raisins from the small loaf, but leave the big loaf alone. From then on, I took raisins from only the small loaf, and I was convinced that Lizzie really thought it was a bird that took the raisins. Lizzie, her husband John, and their son Robert were Protestants. There was a parson named Sides, but most of the Protestant population was old, except for one or two young people. As a Catholic, one must learn the catechism at the age of seven in order to receive First Communion. It tells you that at the age of seven you are able to reason, I can think for myself. It tells me I must love my neighbor, son of a gun. You must do good to those who hate you. All of this is running through my mind, and one day, I'm still seven, I ran to the post office, and Lizzie is standing in the door enjoying the good weather. I stood alongside of her, and she talked to me like I was a little grown-up man. Her husband was out, as he often was, wandering around, picking up old branches and other pieces of wood for the fire. As we were standing in the door, we saw her husband, John, coming. She said to me, There's your man, here he comes. As John reaches the door, as he's going in, he falls back on her. Lizzie grabs John by his shoulders and said, Grab his legs! Grab his legs! I was small, but I got in between his legs like I was holding a wheelbarrow. I'm backing into the kitchen, and then she turns and she backs into the bedroom, and we get him onto the bed. He's dead. My father and mother knew how much I loved Lizzie and John, and so I was allowed to stay up late at the wake. The second night of the wake, I went outside at about 8 p.m. and I saw four people standing about a hundred yards up the road. It was Patty Kelly, John McParland, John Clinton, and Mick Lavin. In today's world, they would be called yuppies. Even as a kid, I knew they were the hotshot cool dudes. They didn't know what to do when they got inside the wake house. They wanted to know if you stand or kneel by the bed. I told them everybody kneels and says a prayer. I felt like a big little man telling the cool dudes what to do at a Protestant wake. The next day, being a Sunday, most of the Catholics went to church. Father Lynch gave a sermon on the death of John Patterson, the Protestant. Knowing there were not enough young Protestants to carry the coffin, he shouted from the pulpit that it would be a mortal sin for any Catholic to go inside a Protestant church and you would go to hell. I'm all confused. Catechism is teaching me to love my neighbor, to love even those who hate me, and now this man of God is telling me that I can't go into Lizzie's church? What is Lizzie going to think of me? But I was in luck. My father had some clout, mostly because he had the shop. He went to talk to his very good friend, Jim Connors. I went with him. He said to Jim that John Patterson and his family had been around a lot longer than Father Lynch, and it would be a bigger sin if we didn't show the family respect and bury him. Then they went to the other neighbors, and John got a good send-off. I was so happy. But now I'm thinking about Lynch and God, but I still have to do what I'm told. My father was a character. He would be locked up today for some of his devilment. When you are ten years old, you go for confirmation, and you take the pledge that you won't drink until you're twenty-one. It's a big day for all the families, as this is the only day you see the bishop. It's happening in the big church in the town called Drumkirin. 
We go very early, my mother, father, and sisters. We all got in the horse and trap. My father drops my mother and sisters off at the church. Then he and I go up a back road to a big backyard called Dolan's. Dolan's is the distributor for all the country stores, plus has a bar and restaurant. Back in the 1950s, all bars in Ireland had a little room called a snug, where two or three people can go for privacy. You go in and order a drink through a small door that you would slide open, and the bartender doesn't know who's in there. My father meets a friend, George Bowles. We go into the snug. They start discussing me going for confirmation. George, being Protestant, says to my father, In your religion, does the kid have to take the pledge until he's 21? That's right, says my father. Well, says George, if it's okay by you, I'd like to buy him a shot of whiskey before he takes the pledge. My father looked at me and said, Is that okay with you? I looked at him and nodded, and nodded again. Okay. Yes, said my father. George slid the board over and ordered three shots of Paddy's whiskey. We all tipped glasses and I threw it right back. I can't remember if I drank something with it, but I'm sure I did. I must have done such a good job that my father said to George, Well, by God, he's my son, and if you can buy him one, so can I. He slid the board over and said, Three more patties. We tipped glasses again, and I threw it back again. I found it very interesting, but I didn't feel a thing. It had no effect on me, and I wondered why people drank. About my father. In 1958, he left for America to live with my sister in Long Island. He got a job at a racetrack, which was good as he loved horses. After the confirmation, I'm still questioning Father Lynch, God, and the Catechism. Already I'm having my doubts. I had never met such good people as Lizzie and John. So when Sunday came, mother and father and my sisters went to the local church in the horse and trap for 10 a.m. mass. I would jump on the bike and say I'm going with Mick Corrigan to drum Kieran for the 11 a.m. mass. Mick was a bachelor who lived half a mile away with his uncle, Pat Gwicken. Pat's brother, John, willed the farm to Mick. The deal was he would take care of Pat until he died. Mick and his friends, all aged 25 to 40, would stand at the back door of the church for 15 minutes and then go to the pub, me with them, drinking a soft drink called Stone Beer. The Mission Every seven years, the Catholic Church brought in fire and brimstone preachers for two weeks, one week for men and one week for women. I never did understand why they separated the men from the women. There was one man named Staffy Nelly. Staffy said he traveled the world. He once told us he was walking for days and came to within three miles of hell. We asked him, how did you know? He said that he had six eggs and that he had put them on a rock and they fried in ten seconds. He knew it was then time to turn back. As kids, we loved his stories. Staffy never went to church. When the missionaries came, all the women that were heavy into religion wanted to save Staffy's soul. They kept nagging him when they all met in the shop. He finally gave in and went one night to the missions. Those missionaries. Not only would they put the fear of God into you, they would scare the hell out of you. The night that Staffy went to church, this mad preacher was walking up and down the aisle saying that bad people went to hell and that his own father was a bad person and he was in hell. That was it for Staffy. He got up to leave, but the preacher yelled, You come back here and sit down! But Staffy just kept on walking. And so the preacher yelled, If you go out that door, then you're going to hell! Staffy stopped, turned around, and said to the preacher, Do you have a message for your old man? This was talked about for years. If she ain't working, shut her down! There were lots of families in the area named McPartland. We used to hear people talk about a man, Seamus McPartland, who went to Chicago and became a millionaire and owned supermarkets. We did not know what supermarkets were back then. After 20 years, he came back on vacation, and he really looked the part. He wore a white suit and a big hat, and he shipped home a big American car for himself. Drum Kieran was where the Catholic canon, Wren, lived, and he put out word that he would like to meet the returned Yank, Seamus McPartland, but Seamus did not want to meet him. One day they met in the middle of the town. 
The canon started telling Seamus that it was the education he got in Drum Kieran that gave him a start in life to become a millionaire in America. And now the local church needs a new roof and a sidewalk, etc. Seamus never opened his mouth until Canon Wren was finished. Then he said, As they say in America, If she ain't working, shut her down. Those guys who returned from the States, they're not giving the clergy the fear and respect that they were used to getting. I'm very happy. There were a lot of characters around. A family, the McFaddens, Teresa, Jack, Willie, Huey, and Peter, had the nickname Odies. Back in the Easter Rising in 1916, Jack was an officer in the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. He was in a battle with the English and got wounded and goes into hiding, or on the run as it was called. The English put a price on his head, a reward for his capture. Every cop and English soldier had his picture in his pocket. For two years, the neighbors kept hiding him and feeding him. Eamon de Valera got him a passport so he could get to America. He had to travel to Belfast, get a train from Belcu, County Fermanagh, at 7 a.m. Very dangerous. As Jack told it in a letter, he is standing on the platform. A cop strolls by, stops, keeping his hand close to his chest, takes out the photo and says, Is that you, Jack? Hope you make it and strolls on by. Jack made it to New York, got an apartment on 9th Avenue, and got a job. His sister Teresa came to New York with two friends that she went to school with. They all got work with the same family on the east side of New York as housemaids. They always had Saturday nights off. One Saturday night, at 9 p.m., as they are getting ready to go out, Teresa said she needs face cream and lipstick from the store across the street. She said, I'll be right back. She was never seen again. Years later, in America, I was telling this to a police lieutenant, Flaherty, who I got to know very well. He told me that back in the 1920s and 1930s, the mob used to kidnap young girls off the street, drug them, and put them into prostitution. The following year, Jack was coming into his hallway, and two guys mugged him and killed him. The father died shortly after. Neighbors used to say that the mother was able to come to terms with Jack's death, but not with the loss of Teresa. Since she was never found, the mother never got over it. When Father Lynch was new in the parish, he wanted to get all the people to attend Mass, and he heard that Miss Zodie was not attending Mass. He drives in his big car to her house and up the lane, walks to the house hoping to get her back to the church, and she meets him with a pitchfork. He ran for his life. She yells after him, When God tells me where my Teresa is, I might go back to the church. They were the most words she had spoken in twenty years. Two Faiths and None There was Parson Sides for the Protestants and Father Lynch for the Catholics. Parson Sides was a lovely man. Lynch was more of a bully than a priest. When a Catholic and a Protestant married, the Catholic would never convert. The Protestant would give in and become Catholic. But we had a rare experience. Tommy Coyle married Rita Patterson and converted to the Protestant faith. He was considered wild. There was a hill with turns going down from the shop. Tommy would buy the paper, get on the bike, open the paper wide and read it while he went down the hill. Sometime after his marriage, he was going down the hill. There was a large truck coming and he lost his balance and went over the ditch and broke his leg. The following Sunday, Father Lynch made it his sermon. He said we have a member who strayed from the true religion, and what happened to him was a warning to him, to come back to the true religion before something really bad happened to him. In the Protestant church, Parson Sides was giving his sermon. He said, We have a new member in our congregation. He has had a little accident. He's very lucky he came over to our side or he might have broken his neck. My Grandfather Dies Half a mile down the road, there lived a man named Francie Sean Travers with his wife. They had no kids. His Uncle Bobby lived with them. Uncle Bobby had his own farm two miles past our shop. Every day he would go to his farm, check his house and cattle, and come back by the shop. My grandfather, Peter, about the same age as Bobby, was his friend. They would sit on the stoop going up to the house and talk and argue. 
Bobby always felt he was right. Then Peter got sick. He went to bed and never got out of it. He died in about two months. Every day, Bobby would go check on his house and cattle, come back and sit on the stoop for an hour, then go home to his nephew's house. On the morning Grandfather died, Mother looked out and saw Bobby sitting on the stoop. She said to my brother Jim, Go tell Bobby that Peter passed away at 3 a.m. this morning. My brother went out and sat where Peter used to sit and said, Bobby, Peter passed away at 3 a.m. last night. Without hesitation, Bobby asked, How old was he? My brother told him he was 93. He's a liar, said Bobby. Bobby always had to disagree, even with a dead man. Bobby showed no emotion in any situation, but he was a likable rogue. He left Ireland when he was 20 years old and went to Scotland, married a girl, and lived with her for two years. Then he left, went to Australia, married again, stayed a few years, and then left the second wife and went to New York. He got married there also, left her too, and went home to live with his nephew. A neighbor, Mike Flynn, told us that when he was in New York, he saw Bobby and ran up to him and said hello. Bobby said to Mick, I don't know you. You've got the wrong person. That's not my name. Mick figured that Bobby was living in New York under an assumed name and walked away. Now it was the 1930s and the Depression had hit all over the world. A lot of people felt that they could survive better back home rather than where they were. Bobby went back home to Francie, his nephew. Bobby was odd. He would never give you the answer you were looking for. We had a nosy neighbor, Kevin Flynn. He had heard Bobby was in Chicago and Kevin had an uncle there. He asked Bobby what he did there and Bobby told him that he had a wheelbarrow and his job was to wheel daylight into dark corners. Back in Edinburgh, Scotland, Bobby's first wife, Alana, was living with her sister and her husband. Her sister gave her a month to get out. Alana started going through her boxes with letters and, lo and behold, she found Bobby's name and where he lived in Ireland, in Corrie, County Leitrim. With nothing to lose and two pounds in her pocket, off she went. She took the boat to Belfast, took the train to Belcu, and asked the conductor for Corrie, County Leitrim. He told her, You're in the north. Walk across the bridge and you will then be in Black Lion, County Cavan. Anybody there can steer you right for Leitrim. She walked twelve miles to reach Daura, and when she got there, she hit some luck and asked a man, Tom McCown. He told her it's three miles out the road, and that he was going that way. He walked her right to the house. It was 10 p.m. She looked in the window and said to McCown in her Scottish accent, That's me boy -o. He was sitting in a chair by the fire and smoking his pipe. My father and a few other neighbors were in the house. She knocked on the door and Francie's wife opened the door, and this strange woman said, I'm here to see Bobby. Come in. She walked right up to Bobby and looked down at him. He took his pipe out of his mouth, looked up at her as if he had seen her the day before, and said hello. Francie's wife must have seen an opportunity. She told Alana how Bobby had his own house, land, and cattle. Alana said, I'll stay here tonight. The floor is fine, and tomorrow you and I, Bobby, will go home. The next day, bright and early, off the two of them went to her new home. He never complained. For weeks she was painting, scrubbing blankets outside, hanging them on clotheslines. She was using a six-foot stick to beat the dust out of the clothes. She worked hard. Bobby liked to sit down and watch her work. The neighbors loved her. She lived there for 22 years, died there, and was buried there. She never talked about Scotland. I guess there was nothing in Scotland for her. When she died... Bobby moved back to Francie and the wife and died there. Unwanted Babies Back in the 1900s through the 1950s, there were orphanages for babies from unwed mothers, which the government paid the church to run. These children were considered by the nuns and the priests to be the devil's children, and they were treated badly. Here we go again. I kept asking myself, where is this invisible character called God? In the spring of 2017 in Tuan, County Galway, the skulls of 780 babies were found in a graveyard at a convent. Let's continue. Since the orphanages were getting overcrowded with older kids, the church came up with a plan for all those kids to be adopted. 
Here's the way it worked. If you were a man who had a trade, you did not have to be married to adopt a boy. And there were a lot of men who had never been with a woman, and a lot of women who had never been with a man. Back in those days, a woman could not go and talk to a man, and a man could not talk to a woman. You had to have a go-between, called a matchmaker. Now, back to the adoption. This man Tom Dorsey was a shoemaker who lived up in the mountains. Single and heading towards 50 years old, the neighbors said, Tom, you're getting on in years. Use this as an opportunity to get a young boy to help you. You can teach him the trade and you'll be looked after when you get older. He filled out the paperwork to adopt a boy and was approved. He got himself a young boy named Peter Murphy, 12 years old. As Peter told the story years later, the house had three rooms. When you walked into the house, there was the kitchen, which was used for making the shoes and for cooking. There was a bed in the corner. That was where Peter slept. He didn't mind as it was the warmest room in the house. There was a room that had a bed but was never used. Tom slept in the upper bedroom. Three years went by and Tom was at the fair. He saw this woman and inquired who she was. He found out that her name was Mary Coyle and that she lived alone on a small farm that her father had left her. The matchmaker tells Mary that Tom would like to marry her and it would be nice for her to have a man and a boy. The boy could look after her land and cattle and she could go every day and see her own house and then go to Tom's house and cook and have company to talk to. She was very nervous. She had never been with a man, but she liked the idea of a man looking after her, her land, and the cattle. She said, I'll do it. The match was made, and the church date was set. Everybody was in the church. When the priest finished with the I do's, he asked for ten pounds. Tom said, Ten pounds? Jesus Christ, ten pounds? If I knew it was going to be ten pounds, I wouldn't have got married at all. They got married at 8 a.m., and they took the 10 a.m. bus to Sligo for the day. They had to be back by nighttime to milk the cows. Now comes their first night together. I must explain that, back in that era, men wore long white nightshirts that came down in a V-shape to your knees. As Peter told it, he was sleeping by the fire. Tom and Mary went up to their room. After ten minutes, Mary started screaming, came running down out of the room, still screaming, No! 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 With Tom right behind her, with an erection so hard that his shirt was sticking way out. Into the other room they went, and she was still screaming, You're not going to stick that thing into me! Tom was saying, But, but we're married now, Mary! He didn't get his way that night. Peter stayed with Tom and Mary. They had no kids. I often wondered why. Years went by, and Mary died. When Tom died, he willed the house and the small piece of land to Peter. Peter married a lady called B. Daniels. They had two daughters, Mary and Sue, and a son, Frank. B. and the daughters went to America. Mary went to night school and became a registered nurse. She met a doctor and lived in Connecticut. B. worked for a family on Park Avenue in New York City. They loved her. Sue met a Wall Street businessman, married and lived in Westchester. Frank stayed home in Ireland with the father. This I must explain. There was a small plot of land in front of the house where there was a large bank of clay. One tree grew on it. The tree was ten foot tall with a few branches from six foot up to the top. At night, when you opened the door, this lonely tree looked scary. Frank got up late at 10 a.m. one morning, and when he opened the door to look out, there was his father, Peter, hanging from the tree. This tree was already scary enough to look at, and now your father is hanging from it? I guess Peter never got over it. Back then, in Ireland, if you were born out of wedlock, even the priests liked to remind you of it. Love your neighbor. Good on ya, Father Lynch. On the Farm With the turf stacked by the road at the bog, it's time to cart all the cow manure to the fields one to two acres, and a plow or dig ridges and set potatoes. Then we set oats grain with a harrow tied behind a horse in the field where we grew the potatoes last year. Now we have to cut the hay and dry it and put it in big piles called rucks and bring it into the haggard in August or September. And still, we kids had to do our homework for school. I don't know how we learned anything. Now I'm going to tell you about taking home the turf. Every farmer stacked his turf by the side of the road at the bog. It took two or three days to bring the turf home from the bog, and neighbors would lend each other their donkeys until the turf was brought home. 
Each night we would take the big baskets called creels and saddles off the donkeys and ride them to the gate going out on the hill. Our neighbor Tommy Trier had the crazy one. When we pulled the donkey's hair, he would jump and kick, and we kids would fight each other to ride him. The second night, when we removed the creels, I was the first one on the donkey's back. I was only four years old. My sister, Bernadette, jumped up behind me and tried to get up front by holding my shoulders and putting her right leg in front of me onto the donkey's neck and trying to jump in front. The donkey was standing on the cement walkway that went from the house to the road. We both fell off, her on top of me. I screamed in pain. They took me into the house and they figured my arm was broken, so they wrapped it in a blanket, gave me hot milk, and told me they would take me to Manor Hamilton Hospital the next day. I have no memory of the pain or of being in the hospital. I do remember coming home with a plaster of Paris cast on my arm from my fingers to my shoulder. One month went by. They took me back to the hospital where they removed the plaster of Paris cast and, much to their surprise, they had missed an elbow break. There was a lot of talk for a few days and then they dropped the bomb. Back then, hospitals were not held responsible for their mistakes. They told my father that my arm would have to be amputated. My father said, no, there has to be another way. Then they told him about Jervis Street Hospital in Dublin. My mother took me by train to Jervis Street and left me there. I remember crying. A week went by. A neighbor, Casey Flynn, came to see me. I remember making it very hard for her to leave. Every time she would get up to leave, I'd cry. I wanted to go home. The doctors at Jervis Street could do nothing, but they found a doctor who could, a specialist in Paris, France. Father had to pay to bring him to Dublin. I never heard my mother or my father mention what it cost. People never mentioned money ever, but I do think I'm the reason we all had to come to America, my mother at 59 and my father at 72, and they both got jobs. My mother in a restaurant called Schrafts, my father in the stables with horses, which was right up his alley. What a big change from being your own boss all your life to this, and at such an advanced age. Anyway, I was at the Jervis Street Hospital for three months. The French doctor's name was Dr. Chance. He told my father he would take a vein from my right arm, six inches up from my wrist, and put it in my left elbow. My arm couldn't straighten out, but someone who didn't know me would have to be told in order to notice it. Dr. Chance told my father he must never stop reminding his kid that he must never talk about his arm, because at school, kids can be mean if they know about my arm not being able to straighten out. When I got into a fight, my arm would be what they would jump on, and if it got broken again, that's it. It would have to be amputated. I had a lot of pain in it until I was 14, but I never talked about it, only to my parents, and then only once in a while. They would tell me, be a man, it's only growing pains. I'd believe them, but when I was about 11, the pain had become very bad, and they found a doctor with his own practice 12 miles away. Off you go, they said to me. Get on your bike and go see him. I rode my bike to Manor Hamilton. The doctor brought me to his office. He sat across the table from me and asked me what was wrong. I was scared to mention the pain, so I told him that my elbow creaked a lot. It did. I moved my elbow and he could hear it. Creak, creak, creak. He stood up, he must have been six foot four inches tall, and lifted his hand up and twisted it around, and his shoulder blade went creak, creak, creak. Man, it was loud. He looked at me and said, All great men have creaks. Get out of here. No charge. I had creaks in my elbow until I was 25, but I never complained about them again. My father was so proud that my arm did not have to be amputated, when I was at a bar with him and his friends, he would brag to his friends how he managed to find Dr. Chance, who was able to save my arm. He would say to his friends, You see, I took a chance on Dr. Chance. Church and Land Priests and the Catholic Church in Ireland When God's power corrupts, the result is absolute corruption. Back in the 1800s, when England owned Ireland and controlled the country, the best land was owned and run by the English landlords. The people worked and lived on the land for no pay, just like slaves. In 1880, the people decided not to work. That was the beginning of what was called the Land Wars. 
the people got evicted from all the landlords' land. These evictions by the English go back to the 13th century. They started living along the sides of the roads, traveling from county to county. They learned a trade, making tin cups, saucepans, and buckets, and down through the generations, they became known as tinkers and tinsmiths. They loved their lifestyles. Today they're called travelers. They will deal in anything. They would rob anything and everything, and they loved horses, and they fought among themselves at the drop of a hat. Bar owners hated to see them come into their bars. The land wars worked. They were very successful. In County Mayo, there was a landowner named Captain Boycott. The land wars were so successful that Boycott went broke and left Ireland and went back to live in England for good. In the dictionary, you will find the word boycott. The word meant when people are told not to help their neighbors and even let them die. When the English had to give the land back to the Irish people, they divided the land into small farms in such a way that all farmers had access to the road, but often the road was closer by going through a neighbor's land. They called it the shortcut. This worked fine until there was a fight and then the farmer could no longer use the shortcut. The one who lost the shortcut would run to the English establishment. The English had spies, and the English thinking was genius. Then came 1920, and Ireland got its freedom, had its own government, and ran itself. But the Catholic Church had more power than the government, and used the same technique, boycotting, on their own people. All the Protestants saw it coming, and all who could get out did so, and went north. There was this man, Frank McFadden, who lived next to John Sully. Sully owned a half-acre field close to Frank's home, and the field was Frank's shortcut to the road. Frank always stayed friends with Sully, and he always asked Sully to sell him his half-acre field. Finally, Sully gave in and Frank got his half-acre and the shortcut to the road was his. Two years later, Sully died. Sully's wife, Bridie, never liked Frank. At Sully's grave, she told Frank that she wanted the half-acre back. Frank said, not now. She went to his house the next day and demanded the half-acre back. Frank said, I've been trying to buy that half-acre for twenty years. It's of no benefit to you. It never was. And now you want it back so you can make me go the long way around. It's a big asset to me. It's mine now, and I'm not giving it back. Bridie was very friendly with Father McGinnis. Bridie went to Father McGinnis and asked him to help her get the half-acre back. McGinnis agreed to help her and went to Frank and demanded that he give it back, but Frank said no. McGinnis said, I'll have you boycotted. The following Sunday, McGinnis gave a sermon saying that Frank McFadden was the devil, and as of next Sunday, he would be boycotted. I want the pipe and drum band here and nobody to leave after the mass is over. Man, did priests have power. The next Sunday, after Mass, McGinnis lined up the band and lined up all the people behind the band. He got in front, like Moses, and with the band blaring, marched through the countryside for six miles to Frank's house and then marched around it, still banging drums, three times for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He shook holy water and then he said, This devil is done for! Nobody talks or does anything for him! And these are the people who told me when I was a kid to do good to those that hated me. Back then, everybody needed flour to make bread. My father went to Frank late at night. They hatched a plan. My father would go to the top of the hill and hide a half bag of flour under a tree. Frank would come at one or two in the morning and pick it up. If anybody saw them and ratted them out, my mother and father would be boycotted, and that would be the end of the shop. My Father's Family my father's grandfather was a blacksmith. He had four sons, and he taught them all the trade. Each one of them had their own blacksmith shop, one each in Dabali, Daura, Kravali, and Drumkiran. The father of the four sons had the home place in Kori. When he died, my father's father, whose name was Simeon, got the home place. His three brothers decided to quit the blacksmith trade and traveled to America. We heard they settled in Boston and upstate New York. My father had one brother, James, and one sister, Mary. The father, Simeon, had a bad accident and died at the age of 33, the same age as Jesus Christ. The mother sent them all to America. 
His brother James put himself through school and went on to become commissioner of jurors, county clerk of Manhattan, head of the Irish Historical Society, and speaker for the New York Democratic Party. When FDR came to New York, he would give the introduction speech. Mary married Joe Carney, who had a brother, Tom. They both worked for the Brooklyn Gas Company, Tom Days and Joe Knights. They both drove their cars to work. One day, Joe was running late going to work. He was speeding, ran a red light, and went head-on and crashed into his brother, Tom. What a coincidence! Tom was seriously hurt. He was in the hospital for months and couldn't work for a year. Back then, people did not have any insurance. Joe paid all his bills and mortgage for two years. My father got a job as a conductor on the 9th Avenue trolley and fell between two cars and was dragged four blocks. He was in the hospital for ten months. He got what was a huge settlement for that time, $3,000. His brother, James, and his sister, Mary, suggested that he return to Ireland with all that money and take care of his mother, and so he did go back and built a new home. Our land was all around the main road. The house was about 200 feet from the road. He knocked it down, but kept one thatched room, I guess for sentimental reasons. He built a two-story slate roof house with a thatched room attached to it. Then he built a two-story shop at the road, a cow barn, a dairy house, a hen house, a horse shed, a shed for oats, a turf shed, and a shed for all the farm machinery. It looked like a small village. He was in his thirties when he met my mother. She was eighteen years old and lived up the mountain. She loved him until the day he died, and after he died. I used to joke with her, Mom, you saw the money and that was your chance to get out of the mountain. Been taught not to hate. When I was a kid, I slept in the thatched room with my father. He always slept on his back. I would sleep with my legs over his belly and we would talk ourselves to sleep. I must have been eight or ten years old and the schoolmaster was teaching us Irish history. About how the English invaded us, killed the men, kidnapped all the young girls and burned homes. I was really getting to hate the English. One night in bed, I say to my father, The English are very bad people. Can you tell me something about them? I look back and think of my father as a man who knew how to teach his kid not to hate. He said to me, Well, I recall one Sunday evening, we knew there was going to be no fighting. The English army, two hundred of them, were leaving Balinaglera, going along the road marching fifteen miles to Manor Hamilton. We were all out by the shop watching them march by. One young man stepped out of line and asked for a mug of water. I asked your mother to get it. He drank it and handed the mug back and ran on. We watched him get back in his lineup by the post office. My father says that that young man did not want to be marching roads in Ireland on a Sunday evening. He would rather be back in his home with his family having tea. I still want to see a 32-county United Ireland before I die, but that history teacher was not able to get me to hate all English people like he did. Thank you, Father, 